All right, hey everyone. Uh, I'll just go ahead and start uh, with packet eight. <clears throat> but at any time, if you have any questions, you can feel free to just um, unmute your mic or uh, you can put it in the chat box and I'll be checking that um, over the course of this session. Okay, so starting with number one, uh, the rate at which cars enter a parking lot is modeled by EFT, so keep in mind that EFT is a rate. And then there's also another um, rate at which cars leaving that's given by a different differentiable function L. So here um, is L of T also in cars per hour, also a rate. Both EFT and L of T are measured in cars per hour, and time T is measured in hours after 5 a.m. Both functions are defined for T values between 0 and 12, so hours after 5 a.m. So part A, what is the rate of change of E of T at time T equals 7? Indicate units of measure. So um, we know that E of T is already a rate, so it's asking for the rate of this E of T, so we know we have to get to something that is derivative related. Um, this is not a table, this is the function, so we can actually find the exact rate of change. We can do E prime of seven. So in your calculator, um, I entered in <clears throat> E of T under Y1, and then I did math eight to get that end derivative feature. And I have E of T stored under Y1. Technically, you don't have to go all the way to four decimal places. If you just do 6.164 or 6.165, that's good enough. And then uh, indicate units of measure. Rate of change of E of T is 6.165 cars per hour squared or cars per hour per hour. Okay, part B. How many cars enter the parking lot? So again, we're just working with E of T. We still aren't concerned about how many cars are leaving or how many cars are in the lot. We just want to know how many have entered. So all we need is E of T um, to help solve for part B. Uh, between times 0 and 12, that's pretty straightforward. Um, we want to accumulate this rate over the course of the 12-hour period. So we have to basically change. So anytime we want to change units, we're going to take, um, in this case, take the antiderivative. This will bring us from cars per hour up to the number of cars, so around 520 cars. Okay, part C, use trapezoidal sum with four subintervals. Okay, so um, to approximate the integral from 2 to 12 of L of t, so if L of t is the rate at which cars are leaving, we know the accumulation of that rate is going to actually give us the actual number of cars or actually approximate the number of total cars uh, that has left the parking lot. So um, the area for trapezoid is one half width, height one plus height two. So we want to find the width uh, by subtracting from each of the uh, t uh, values from the t table. So three, five minus two is three, nine minus five, 11 minus nine, and 12 minus 11. And then within each subinterval, we want to choose the appropriate um, height component or the L of T, which will uh, compose of um, the height of the trapezoid. So one half times three, height one plus height two. So um, that one mistake that I saw on previous tests where students were subtracting to get the width and they will also subtract um, the height. So you're going to have to add the heights, but subtract the t values to get to uh, the width. OK, so uh, one half width, height one plus height two, and then um, the second trapezoid, one half width, height one plus height two. Then we repeat that process for each of the four trapezoids that we're building. Okay, and I get 345.5. And this represents the total number of cars that leave the parking lot in the 10 hours between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. Now, L of T starts off as a rate but the integral 
it's going to change that unit. It's going to make that unit uh, rise from cars per hour to the total number of cars. Part D, now between zero and six hours, $5 are collected from each car entering the parking lot. And then between six and 12 hours, $8 are collected. How much money collected up from the cars entering the parking lot from zero to 12? Give your answer to the nearest dollar. So we know we, we have two, um, two different ranges of, uh, of cars that are, um, cars that enter in the parking lot at different times are charged at different rates. So we know that the, we can first accumulate the total number of cars uh, that enter in to the parking lot. And then once you get that number of cars between zero and six hours, we'll take that number and multiply it by five. And then the number and then the cars that enter between six and 12 hours, we can get that number, multiply that by eight. And this will give us the uh, money collected um, in the first six hours. This will give us the money collected in the next six hours. Add those together, and we're going to round to the nearest dollar, $3,530 collected um, from, um, from, T, from, zero, from the zeroth hour to the twelfth hour. All right, uh, number two. All right, so number two is uh, also calculator active. Uh, during the time interval from uh, zero to 4.5 hours, water flows into the tank at a rate of A of T. So typically they give you a problem and to give you a, a function is usually going to be in the at the, at the, at the rate level. <clears throat> okay, two t minus five plus five e to the two sine t liters per hour during the same time interval. Water flows in the tank B at a rate of b of t. Both tanks are empty at time t equals zero. The graph of a of t and b of t are shown, and they intersect at t equals k and t equals two point four one six. Okay, so starting with part a. Uh, how much water will be in the tank at time t equals uh, 4.5. So, um, right, so these are two different tanks here. So uh, the, the two rates are not going to um, uh, affect each other. So if we want to find out how much water is in tank A, we can just worry about um, A of T. There's not another rate that is um, leaving the tank. Okay, so, and there's no water uh, to begin at equals zero, so we don't have to um, add onto what's already in the tank. If there were, if there was, then we have to add the integral from zero to 4.5 plus ho however much there was to begin with, but there's no water to begin with in the tank. So the integral from zero to 4.5, whatever we get is the actual amount of water in the tank. Okay, so we just make the, our calcul calculator do that work for us there. The integral from 0 to 4.5 of A of T is 66.532. So we know that um, uh, in that 4.5 hour period, uh, by the time uh, the time reaches 4.5 hours, tank A would have collected 66.532 liters of water. Okay, part B. <clears throat> Let me start with a fresh copy here. All
Okay, sorry. Let's see for part B here. Okay, during the time interval from um, zero to K hours, water flow into the into tank B at a constant rate of 20.5 liters per hour. So this is tank B, and I think we have to recognize that this is going to be a flat line here. So between zero and K hours, that's where um, K is located. K is located at that intersection. So this is T equals K hours. And they're telling us that at tank B, it's a constant rate of 20.5 liters. So I know it may be hard to see, but we have to recognize this as a straight line here, straight line here. And then after that, it starts to curve. Okay, But up until this point, it's going to be just a straight line. Okay, So um, what is the difference between the amount of water in tank A and the amount of water in tank B at time t equals k? So if we know that this is a y value, of um, or b of t at this point is equal to 20.5. Then what we can do is we can set 20, we can graph that um, 20.5 and we can graph the curve a of t and we can look for that t equals k intersection. Okay. So let me see if I can do that. I'm not going to be able to see it with a um, zoom six. And the reason why is because um, this is all the way up at 20.5, but my window is only stretching up to a Y max of 10. So I need to move this to at least 20.5. Um, let me just want to go to 25 here just so I can just make it uh, near the, not near the very edge of my uh, table here, of my graph, I mean. Okay, so if you want, you can um, play with the window some more, or in this case, maybe it's easier to just do a zoom box. Just uh, see if I can draw a box around that region there. Hit enter, drag your graph, enter again. I know my graph is going to change after this point. It's going to curve, but I know up until that point, it's going to hold that 20.5. So I'm just I'm going to use that 20.5 line just so I can find my intersection. I'm going to need that intersection for my integral uh, bounds. Okay, so second trace. Select your intersect feature. Pick a point. Um, on the curve, and then you can pick a point on the line, and then it'll find that intersection for you. There it is, 0.892. Okay, so t equals 0.892. Okay, so um, what's the difference between the amount of water in tank A and the amount of water in tank B? So why don't we do this? Why don't we figure out how much water is in tank A? And figure out how much water is in tank B, and then we can just subtract it. Okay. Now we this is a rate, so we know that tank B is going to have uh, more water going into its um, tank at a higher rate than the rate at which A of T is rising. Uh, a of T, uh, the rate at which water is entering in, into its tank is rising, but it's definitely going to be less. So uh, I'm going to say the integral from zero to point. 892 for tank B, which is 20.5 dt. This is going to tell me how much water is in tank B up to that this 0.892, right? Everything under this curve is going to represent that minus the integral from 0 to 0.892 for A of T, which is 
this 2t minus 5 plus 5e to sine 2 sine t. I'm not going to um, write it all out. I can just write it like this. OK, so if I subtract those two. Math 9. Now, because they share the same bounds, I can just enter all this under one integral if I wanted to. So I can say 20.5, which is my um, integral for B of T minus A of T. A of T, I have it stored under Y1. I just wrote it out separately to make it easier for us to see the distinction between the two, um, um, the two tanks. But they share the same balance. I can just put all under one. So 10.599. So that means at time t equals k, the difference in the amount of water in tanks A in the, between the tanks is 10.599 liters. Okay. So we know at 0.892, tank B has 10.599 more water than tank A. Part C, the area of the region bounded by the graph of a, uh, by A of T and B of T for K between or between K, which we already found 0.892 and 2.416 is 14.470. So they're giving us the difference between A of T and B of T, at least the rate at which water is entering in, but uh, the area between it. OK, so we now know the difference between A of T and B of T between these two time intervals. Now, they're giving us this information because they're withholding this B of T equation from us. OK, so we're going to need this information kind of work backwards a bit. Um, so. Um, part C is saying how much water. Is in tank B at time T equals 4.2.416. Okay. Now, if we had the equation for B of T, it would be easy because it would say the integral of B of T and then just be done with it. But right, just be able to enter this into the calculator. But they don't give us this B of T information all the way through. We know B of T from 0 to 0.892, but this interval is kind of mis is mysterious, except for the fact that we have this information to work off of. OK. So we can break it into two parts here. We can break it into the known portion and the unknown portion. We know that from 0 to 0.892, the rate at which water is coming into uh, tank B is 20.5. So that's a given. We already know how to find that. What is the unknown is from 0.892 to 2.416, right? We don't know what B of T is, but we do have some information that's related that can help us out, right? So this is the portion that we are trying to reach right now if i want to figure out the area if i want to figure out how much water is in tank b we can actually use information from tank a because this 14.470 is going to give us that difference between a of t and b of t at least in this interval so we can say this we can say that the unknown region from 0.892 to 2.416 is the water collected under in this time interval for a of t which we do have minus 14.470 so the integral from a of t b of t is gonna is gonna include everything up to this curve up to this a of t curve but then if we can subtract out the 14.47 which they give us then that will give us b of t so we take however much water is uh, in tank a subtract 14.47 if we take the whole, if we take this core curve and subtract 14.47, then what we're left with is this remaining portion of B of T that we want. OK, so the integral from 0 0.892 to 2.416 for A of T minus 14.47. So we enter this in the calculator, subtract 14.47 and we get 30.027. So this is the unknown that we just found. We know that um, uh, the water in tank B it's going to start off with this amount plus this amount. And if we add these together, 18.286, which is the result from this, plus 30.027 gives us 48.313. So we know that at 
tank B contains around 48 or a little bit more than 48 liters of um, liters of water. All right, part D. During the time interval from 2.7 to 4.5 hours, the rate at which water flows into tank B is modeled by um, Um, yeah, W of T, which is uh, liters per hour. So now they give us information about B of T, but it's going to be past this point of the unknown here. Is the difference W T minus A of T increasing or decreasing at time T equals 3.5? So we're not asking for W T minus A of T. We're asking if the difference is increasing or decreasing. So if it just says is, is the difference positive or negative, then we can just do W of T minus A of T, but it's asking for increasing or decreasing. It's asking for the rate. So we have to make an adjustment here. This is really not talking about uh, W T minus A of T. It's actually talking about the rate of this. So it's really asking about W prime minus A prime. So we can simply insert 3.5 in for W prime and um, W prime and A prime since we have both um w and a so we can just do math eight of um n derivative for w of t and then n derivative for a of t and then make the calculator um take care of both of it for us so we can just do math eight and enter w of t get that value at 3.5 enter in a of t at 3.5 3.5 get that value in this case we get a negative number so that tells us that the rate at which the, the rate of the difference is decreasing. At t equals 3.5. Okay, number three. Uh, this is non-calculator. Okay, let f be the function defined above. You have f of x. Uh, you have a radical function, and you have a uh, linear plus uh, trig. And this graph is existing between negative three and zero, but the other graph is existing from zero to four. Write the find the average rate of change on the interval from negative three to four. So average rate of change is just the change between order pairs. So we can just find the order pair in this graph at negative three and find the order pair at this graph and just do change in y over change in x. So we'll find f of negative three by plugging negative three in for the radical function, plug in four into the second function because that's where the graph exists at four, and cosine of two pi is the same thing as one, negative four plus three is negative one. So we do change in, change in y over change in x, so negative one minus zero over four minus negative three is negative one seventh. Okay, and that's it. Part B, uh, write an equation for the line tangent to the graph of f at x equals three. So at three, we see three is between zero and four. So <clears throat> it's solely with this second piecewise function. So we're gonna ignore the first piecewise because it's not, um, doesn't exist <clears throat> in the time interval, in this uh, x interval. Only the second function exists. So tangent line equation, we can plug three into the function to get the y value, and then we can find the derivative and then find the slope at that point. Okay, so uh, to find the order pair, plug three into the second piecewise function, and we get um, negative three plus three cosine of three pi over two, cosine three pi over two is zero. So three times zero is zero, zero minus three is negative three. And then we have to find the uh, slope. To find the slope, we have to get to the derivative. To get to the derivative, we got to go through power rule here and then chain rule here. Negative x becomes negative one. Cosine of u becomes cosine of u times u prime. So three times negative sine of pi over two x times pi over two. All right, cosine of u becomes negative sine of u times u prime. <clears throat> okay, 
okay, do some cleanup here. Um, three, negative three times power over two is negative three power over two. Sine of power over two times um, uh, one is, I'm um, oh, sorry, we're plugging in three, right? Sorry, plugging in three uh, in for X. So we get, so the, um, let me clean up F prime of X first. So once I clean up F prime of X, I can replace the X with three. And then sine of three power two is negative one. So negative one minus a three power two times negative one is a positive. So negative one plus three power two or three power two minus one, but this acts as my slope. So I have my slope, I have my order pair, point slope form. No need to clean every, anything up. Once you have it in point slope form, leave it alone. This is good enough to earn full credit. Don't have to <clears throat> clean anything up. Remember, a non-calculator section, once you get to something that is um, equivalent to the final answer, you don't have to clean up. But the only thing you do have to do is make sure that you don't have any trig um, uh, unresolved in your final answer. So if you're leaving this sign 3 power 2 in your final answer, you may lose a point because um, you need to resolve this to at least show to show a negative one. Part C, find the average value. So average value, that's average value theorem. So we go through, uh, there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, use substitution here to go through the full steps here. So average value theorem is the uh, one over B minus A from A to B of F of X. Now, average value theorem uh, for this is going to span across the intervals from negative three to four, but we have two different graphs, right? So that means from, from negative three to zero, we're talking about the area under the, the radical. And then from zero to four, we're talking about the area under the second graph. So we need, we need to treat this integral as two separate things. And again, this is without a calculator, so we have to do this by hand. Okay. So I, have, I, have two, I split into two regions, negative three to zero under the radical, and then from zero to four under um, <clears throat> the second piecewise. Now this one, a little messy, but it feels pretty straightforward because if you just go through your substitution, this cleans up and then it'll be fine. This one, I was looking at it for, uh, for a minute, wondering what rule am I gonna use for this? Because if I go through your substitution, I'm not able to quite get this to work out. And then I realized that they want the students to recognize this as a half circle. So square root of nine minus X squared, rather this is, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a half circle from negative three to three. Okay, so here's something, uh, um, uh, background here. So th this is something, um, that we've learned in the past here, that x squared plus y squared equals nine. This is an equation for the circle, okay? And a circle has the center at zero, zero, because this is in, the, in this form, right? Your center is zero, zero, your radius is three, so your circle goes, All right, so this is technically your circle here. But imagine solving this for y. If I solve for y, I get y squared is equal to nine minus x squared. So y is equal to plus or minus square root of nine minus x squared. So the plus or minus square root tells you the portion above and below. So the, the upper portion is the square root of nine minus x squared. And the bottom portion is the y equals negative square root of nine minus x squared. So they want students to be able to recognize that the square root of nine minus x squared is a half circle, but they say the integral is only for, um, for, for, for this half circle here, it's only going from negative three to zero. So negative three to zero is only from here to here. So they're only showing you quarter circle. So they're just asking, so we have to basically recognize this as a half circle and that it's only asking for the area of a quarter circle. So quarter circle is one fourth pi r squared. And even though we can't solve this using integral rules, this is technically a geometric shape and geometric shape, we're asked to connect it with 
the area of a quarter circle. So one fourth pi r squared. The radius of this quarter circle is three. So well, actually the radius of the circle is three and the quarter circle is going to share that same radius. So one fourth pi r squared is nine pi over four. So this initially I was trying to go through use substitution and then realized, oh, this is a sneaky way of uh, of uh, giving us a geometric shape in the form of an equation. OK, so now the second one is more straightforward in the sense that uh, we've seen this before. We just have to go to use substitution. We let our u value be power over 2x. du or dx is power over 2. We solve for dx, which is 2 over pi. We make our substitutions. Uh, 2 over pi is a leftover coefficient. We push that 2 over pi out. And then integral of cosine is positive sine. Uh, we bring the back the coefficient. Don't forget about the negative x that was sitting at the beginning of the problem. So this also gets influenced by the integral. Negative x becomes negative x squared over 2. And then we can start plugging in the bounds. Upper bound in for the expression first, then the lower bound. The nice thing about 0 in this case, 0 is going to wipe both terms out. But just be careful because not every 0 is going to do that. So make sure that you're actually checking and, and convincing yourself that a zero is doing the job of wiping it out. Okay. All right. So in this case, the four is going to make this a negative eight. The four is going to make this a uh, um, sine of two pi. That's going to zero out. So that's going to be zero. So negative eight plus zero is negative eight. So we know the area of the second uh, um, piecewise is going to be negative eight, where the region is negative eight. The first one is nine pi over four. So we add those together, nine pi over four minus eight. That's the that's the full integral. But remember, this is average value theorem, so I got to remember to uh, carry over that 1 over b minus a. 4 minus negative 3 is 7, so 1 over 7 needs to be part of my final answer. So 1 7 is the 1 over b minus a, and the integral is a 9 pi over 4 minus 8. No need to distribute and clean up. I can leave my answer in this form. Okay, hey, part D. Must there be a value of x such that f of x attains an absolute maximum on the closed interval from negative 3 to 4? Um, justify your answer. So we can say that um, uh, the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x equals f of 0 equals 3. Basically, I'm just stepping through continuity conditions to show that the function is continuous. So the function is continuous, then extreme value theorem. Um, can guarantee that we reach an absolute max. So it's not asking us to find the absolute max. It's just basically asking us to, um, or asking uh, students to, to um, state that there is a continuity condition that's required for EBT, and then to show that the function is continuous. Okay, function is continuous because at zero, where there's a potential breaking point, the limit as um, as x approaches zero from the left is equal to this. So if I plug zero into both functions, they're both the same. So we know the two graphs are going to connect. It does not have to be differentiable. Just as long as the graphs connect, that's good enough to confirm that it's, co it's continuous because we know it's continuous within the first interval. We know it's continuous within the second interval. We're just now convincing ourselves that, that they are connected across the two graphs. Take number four, also non-calculator. Continuous function f is defined between negative four and four. The graph of f is shown here. It consists of two line segments, so we have two line segments here, and then you got three parabolas here. You got a parabola here, parabola B, and then there's this uh, another parabola here. The graph has a horizontal tangent at negative one half, one half, and five halves. So it just tells us that there's a slope zero at 
negative one half. There's also a slope zero at one half, and there's also a slope zero at 2.5. It is known that the function f of x is negative x squared plus 5x minus 4 between 1 and 4. So they do give us a known um, function to work with here from 1 to 4. The areas of region A and B are bounded by the graph of f and the x-axis are 3 and 5. So uh, they're not giving us the equations for A and B, but they are telling us the area is 3 and 5. So here I put a 5 here. Here I adapted the area of 3 to show a negative 3 because we know uh, the integral of a negative of uh, uh, regions in the negative um, below the x-axis uh, will produce a value of negative three, uh, 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 produce a negative value. Let g be the function defined by g of x from negative four to x. So g of x um, is the integral of f, which tells us that um, this is really the um, um, the g prime graph. Right. If it takes the integral of f to rise up to g, then the relationship here is that we're looking at the g prime. OK, so it says find g of zero. So g of zero is simply the integral from negative four to zero from negative four to zero. Um, uh, we can just um, do the area, right? These are uh, this area of a triangle, which is nice. We can just do one half base times height. Um, so. Uh, nine halves. Let's see, from negative four, oh, sorry, negative four to zero. So negative four to zero, we have the area of a triangle, and then we also have the um, uh, the, the region, which is negative three. So the area of the triangle is one half base times height. So base is four, sorry, base is three, and the height is three. So one half three times three is nine halves. So nine halves is this region here. So nine halves minus three, it's gonna be three halves. So nine halves plus negative three, how's that? So I'm adding the two together, nine halves plus a negative three, which is thinking as nine halves minus three, which is three halves. Okay, part B, find the absolute minimum, oh, I'm sorry, uh, it's asking for g of zero and g of four. Okay, so we need to go a little further here. So to find g of four, uh, G of four, we go back to our definition. It goes from negative four to um, four. So negative four to four, um, we'll have to add this region, this region, this region, plus the integral from one to four. So integral from one to four, we have to go through power rule to do that. Again, non-calculator, so we can't enter this in the calculator here. So go through power rule here, negative x cubed over three, plus five x squared over two, minus four x, evaluated between one and four. It's it's a little um, tedious uh, having to work all this out, um, but we get negative 64 over 3 plus 5 halves times 16 minus 16 minus all this. Now, uh, this is tedious, and if it's if it's uh, this shows up on the AP exam with this much um, messiness to clean up, you can leave your answer like this. You can do 9 halves minus 3 plus 5 plus this. So you can leave your answer in um, a extremely messy form. You can do nine halves minus three plus five minus this plus this minus this plus this minus this plus this. If you want to distribute negative through or you don't have to distribute negative if you don't want to, but you can leave your answer in this form rather than cleaning it up all the way to fractions and getting down to 11. Okay. In fact, if it's not a calculator, you leave your answer in this form. It's not worth all that you know, that extra two, three minutes that you could be saving you, if you're already staring at the final answer. This if you can if you're going to get earn full credit here, just move on, even though it doesn't look pretty. This will earn you full credit, but you have to put these together. Add just show that and you know, put a box around all these numbers added together. OK, part B, find the absolute minimum, so. We know that this is uh, referring to getting you to try to use extreme value theorem. So extreme value theorem says I need to test endpoints and critical points. Remember, this is F, but it's also G prime. So let's create a slope sign line here so we can see what critical points we want to test. Remember, anything above the x axis is positive slope. Anything below is negative slope. So my critical points are negative one, 
zero. I'm not going to include one here because it doesn't cross the x axis. So this is neither a relative max or relative min. It's got to cross through to the other side. So I'm only going to test negative four and four because they're endpoints. And I'll test negative one and zero. So here's my sign line. In, uh, increase because it's above the x axis, decrease below the x axis, and then the rest is increase from zero all the way to four. Even, it, even though it hits a zero here, it doesn't, doesn't cross. So there's no relative max, relative min. So I just need to test negative four, negative one, zero, and four, and they all get inserted into this formula here. And I just have to compare the compare the y values. So g of negative four is easy because the bounds are going to match. Whenever the bounds match, you know your area is just zero. From negative four to zero, we found that, right? Which is three halves. Um, g of four is eleven. Um, so even though we didn't have to add all this up, we do have to have some idea where this value is. We, you know, maybe we can just um, clean this up to the point to know that it's a positive number. So positive plus plus positive can't be any um, lower than this value. So we know the absolute minimum must be uh, zero. Right. Part D, part C's rather. Um, find the intervals where the graph is, where the graph of G is concave up. This is the first derivative graph. So concave down is going to be where my G prime is going to show negative slope. So wherever my G prime is showing negative slope, so there is negative slope. So from negative two to negative one half, from one half to one, and then from two point five to four. So I have three separate intervals where my slope is negative, and whenever my slope is negative, that's when my graph is going to show concave down. I also just wanted to show, you know, if you were to um, to fill out uh, a concavity sign line, um, your critical points would be your peaks and valleys, right? Your points of flexions will be at negative two, negative one half, one half, and two two and a half, and then wherever the positive slope is is going to is going to be concave up. Wherever negative slope is, is concave down. So you can also create this table, and then you can also pull this from your sign line. But remember, um, your uh, AP graders are uh, your AP readers are not going to look at your sign lines. Um, to, to this is not going to for your answer. You have to be able to say that um, your the graph is concave down because G prime is decreasing on these intervals. Okay. So again. This, if you if you draw your sign line, it's really just for your benefit. Um, graders are asked to ignore any sign lines. Okay, number five, again, on calculator. Function satisfies f of zero equals 20. The first derivative of f satisfies the inequality from um, f prime is between zero and seven. Selected values of f prime are shown. Function f has a continuous second derivative for all real numbers. Use midpoint Riemann sum. So width times height, width times height, three times here. So uh, width is two minus zero, four minus two, and six minus four. And then we want to pick the heights at the middle um, of the of the y values here. Or uh, the middle of the uh, x value and, and uh, find the y value there. So width times height, width times height, width times height. Um, okay, use it to approximate f of six now. We know that um, the integral from zero to six is only going to tell us the displacement in this interval, okay? Because it tells us f of zero is twenty, so this tells us how much is gained in that period. So if I want to find my final point, it's always going to be initial plus displacement. So we know f of zero is already twenty, and the integral from zero to six of f prime we just found is twenty point two, because that's the area um, uh, using the uh, uh, Riemann sums. So we start at 20, 
we gained another 20.2, so we're going to end up at 40.2. So part B says determine whether the actual value of f of 6 could be 70. So we know that these are just order pairs at f prime. There could be a lot of things occurring between these order pairs that we don't know about, but we do know something here. We do know that um, f prime is never going to be more than 7. Okay, And it says determine whether the actual value could actually be 70. So 70 is a lot higher than 40.2. It's saying, can this value actually be 70? Well, let's do worst case scenario. Worst case scenario would be, let's imagine if f prime was all 7. I know that's not the case because we already see some numbers below 7. But let's just look. Let's just look at worst case scenario. Can it even reach uh, a value of seventy if this whole thing was uh, if this whole thing was seven? So let's imagine just finding an area under all sevens because we know that this area can never be higher than this, right? So um, rather than this curve here, let's just assume that every point has an F prime value of seven, and then we're just going to find the area under seven. Now, this seven is easy here because it's just going to end up, we're going to ignore the curve. Just look at the dotted line here. It's just going to be a rectangle, and the area of the rectangle is seven times six, or six times seven, width of six, height of seven, that's 42. So worst case scenario, if the whole F prime was seven, then the area will be 42. So at most, even though we know it can never happen, 20 plus 42. All right, if we start at 20 and let's say we earn, we were able to gain all the way up to 42, 20 plus 42 is only 62. So at most, it's only going to reach 62. So therefore, the actual area has to be less than 70 or could not be 70, could not reach that 70 because we know the curve is going to be definitely less. The area under the curve is definitely less than the area under the square, under the rectangle. Okay, evaluate the definite integral from two to four of f double prime. If we had the, the f double prime graph, we would look at the area under the f double prime graph, but we don't. So we gotta use a, a different method to evaluate. Now we do have first theorem. So first theorem says, why don't we just take the antiderivative and see what happens? So we know that the integral of f double prime is gonna rise up to f prime. That's first theorem, right? First theorem will take the antiderivative um, and then evaluate the bounds. So f double prime becomes f prime. We can then plug in f prime of four minus f prime of two. Now this we can do because we have the table of values available on, at the f prime level. So f prime of four is 1.7. f prime of two is two. So 1.7 minus two is just negative 0.3. So another uh, advice I want to give is um, sometimes you're, you'll be using first theorem. Sometimes you'll be doing Riemann sums. It really depends on what the data is, right? If, if your table was at the F double prime level, then you can use Riemann sums, but they will have to specify which Riemann sums to use. But because they don't have F double prime in front of you, you have to make, you gotta, you gotta turn this into something else. And first theorem says, I can just take the integral of F double prime, make it rise up to F prime, plug in upper lower bound, and then these order pairs I can find because I, I do have information at that level. Okay, part D, evaluate the limit. So whenever I see a, a funky limit problem, I'm always thinking maybe they're trying to get me to, to use L'Hopital's. But remember, you can't jump to L'Hopital's rule. Um, you got to show to the grader, to the readers, that you are arriving at the appropriate condition for L'Hopital's. So always, always plug in uh, whatever X value they're giving you and gather the data, right? Because if if you plug in zero and if it gets you a real number, then you would stop. There's no need for L'Hopital's rule if this if evaluating the limit of this expression is going to get you a real number. You're only doing L'Hopital's rule if it's specifically getting you zero over zero or infinity over infinity. But typically it's going to be um, zero over zero. All right, so again, use arrows. Um, they're going to complain if they see it equals zero over zero, they don't like that. So make sure you just do arrows all the way across for L'Hopital's or any limit problem. So um, with an arrow here, I'm just gonna show, I'm gonna uh, plug in zero, that's my next step. F of zero is 20, 
e to the zero is also one, so 20 times one is 20. 20 minus 20 is zero. 0.5 times f of zero, f of zero is 20, so half of 20 is 10, 10 minus 10 is also zero. Okay, I can do L'Hopital's rule here. So arrow, limit as x approaches zero, so I'm gonna show L'Hopital's rule. So I'm gonna take the derivative of my numerator and denominator separately. f becomes f prime, 20 e to the x, I gotta do e to the u times u prime, so e to the u times e to the x times one. 0.5 f of x, remember 0.5 is just the coefficient, so it's, it's just gonna hang out in front here f of x becomes f prime, so 0.5 times f prime. 10 is a constant, so 10 will go to 0. So now they have the derivative, reevaluate, re reevaluate 0 in for the x's, and we're hoping now that we're going to get something different than 0 or 0. Hopefully we'll get a real number. So f prime of 0 is 4, e to the 0 is 1, which is 20 times 1 is 20, 4 times 20 is negative 16. F prime of zero is four, half of four is two, two minus zero is two, negative 16 over two is negative eight. All right, again, non calculator, consider a differential equation dy dx. So um, anytime I see a differential equation and I'm asked to separate the variables, I'm always going to try to try to create a fraction equaling a fraction. So I'm going to put a one underneath. And now I'm just going to cross multiply. So when I cross multiply, I know I'm not fully getting a separation, but I am getting my dy dx into the right places. And I'm seeing, okay, how can I get full separation? The y minus 2 is out of place. So I'm going to divide that y minus 2 over. It's going to end up in the denominator. So use substitution with natural log and then power rule on the right side. Okay. So I know it's a little bit of use substitution with that y minus 2. So u equals y minus 2. Okay, dy equals du, make my substitution, it gets, comes out really clean, 1 over u du, which is natural log absolute value of u, and replace the u back in terms of y, so this is my cleaned up version of the left side. The right side, got to power rule, x squared becomes x cubed over 3, 1 becomes x, don't forget the plus c, so you're going to go, only going to write plus c once, and you're going to just have plus c show up on the right side. Okay, so at this stage, you can either solve for C or you can solve for Y first. It doesn't matter. In this case, I've C a natural log here. I'm just going to go ahead and just try to clean this up here. So I'll raise both sides with E as the base. E of natural log goes away. S value of Y minus 2 remains. And then here, I'm going to try to do some cleanup here. Uh, I'm going to separate that C away from the rest of my variables. So instead of plus C, I'm going to do times E to the C. Replace e to the c with just one big uppercase c. Bring that in front. Drop the absolute value because the c will just absorb that plus or minus that comes from that absolute value. And now that I have my, my general equation with that plus 2 over to the right side, now I'm doing this solve for c. So order pair is given to me. Order pair is 0, 5. 0 in for x, 5 in for y. Let's solve for c. So 0 in for x, e to the 0 is 1, c times 1 is c, c plus 2 equals 5, subtract 2 from both sides, c equals 3. So once I have c equals 3, replace 3 in for c, and there's my specific solution. All right, uh, <clears throat> part B for the particular solution, evaluate the limit as x approaches negative infinity. So um, be aware of that. It's negative infinity, not positive infinity. So I'm going to set up my uh, limit expression here, my limits um, notation. So limit as x approaches negative infinity. For 2 plus 3e to the x cubed over 3 plus x, it feels complicated here, but if I just replace x with inf negative infinity, I'm going to see that it's basically going to round out to be just negative infinity. And anything raised to negative infinity, if I want to clean that up, 
let's why don't we make that into a positive exponent remember um so i can do e to the negative infinity is the same thing as one over e to the infinity okay so how does that help well what helps about this is that e to the infinity is a really large number but it's a really large number in the denominator so if you have a really large number in the denominator your overall fraction is going to get smaller and smaller it's going to approach zero so this whole thing is just zero so two plus zero is just two All right, part C. Let F be the particular solution. Find d2y over dx2. So it's asking us to find the second derivative of this level. All right, so this is the first derivative. This is dy dx. We're going to ask to find the second derivative. So to find the second derivative, notice that these are two separate expressions here. I got to go through the product rule, right, to get to the derivative here. So product rule. F is the y minus 2, and g is the x squared plus 1. I'm going to step through and find the derivative of each portion. Okay, so y minus 2's derivative. I'm asking for y's derivative, so I got to do implicit here, right? So y becomes dy dx. 2 goes to 0. x squared plus 1 stays. Back to f. f is y minus 2. g prime, g prime, x squared plus 1 becomes 2x. So now there's my sec. This is my second derivative function, but I want to clean this up so that I can actually evaluate it. I'll replace dy dx with this. Right? Makes it easier for me to evaluate. So I'm going to replace dy dx with something that is more known to me. And now I don't have to clean this up because this is my second derivative, and it's asking is find the second derivative value at 1, 3. So I have my second derivative um, expression in terms of x and y. I can replace every x and y with 1 and 3. And then once I get that number, I'm going to translate that number as um, telling me concave up or concave down. So what I should be able to do is I should be able to plug in my order pair into my second derivative and get it either a positive or a negative number. If I get a positive number, I know that my graph of f of x must be concave up. If I get a negative number, it's telling me that my graph of f is concave down. So I'm going through my process here. Um, this cleans up all the way to a positive six. So since six is greater than zero, my second derivative is positive, and it tells us that my graph must be concave up at 0.13. Number seven, another non calculator here. A hive contains uh, 3,500 bees at time t equals zero. During the time interval from zero to four hours, bees enter the hive at a rate modeled by E of T. E of T is measured in hundreds of bees per hour. During the same time interval, bees leave the hive at a rate modeled by L of T. L of T is measured in hundreds of bees per hour as well. How many bees leave the hive during the time interval from zero to two? So we don't care about how many have entered, how many are in the hive to begin with. We just want to know how many has left. So all we need to work with is L of T. We take the integral of L of T, but we do need to work this out by hand. This, these are nicely set up as power rule problems. So let's just plug in upper, uh, evaluate, uh, find the antiderivative using power rule. So negative 2t becomes negative 2t squared over 2. 15 becomes 15t. No plus c because we have bounds here. So evaluate your bounds from 0 to 2. Upper bound first. Minus lower bound. I get 26. All right, write an expression involving one or more integrals for the total number of b's. So we know rate in, rate out problems have three components. Right, The total number of b's is going to be your initial plus the number added minus the numbers um removed so let's create a formula first so b of t is the um, number of b's at any moment in time b of zero is how many b's there are to begin with in the hive integral from zero to t of e of x is going to be the number 
of uh, bees who've total number of bees who've entered into the hive in this time interval, and then the interval from zero to T of L of T, L of X is going to be number of uh, bees who've left um, the hive in that interval. Okay, so now that we have a formula set up, um, we can find the total number of bees at T equals four. So we can plug uh, four um, into our uh, formula here. So we know B of zero is 35. So there's 35 to begin with, plus however many has, has been added in that, uh, or has entered in that four hour period, and then subtract out the ones who've, uh, the ones who've left in that four hour period. So it's a little bit tedious because we have to go through power rule for both of these. Now, what I did here was um, because these are the same bounds, I just merged them into the same integral and I just did power rule four times. I made sure to distribute the negative through and then I just evaluate the bounds all at once. Four in for all of them, minus zero in for all of them. But you could definitely keep them separated and do them separate as well. But ends up giving us um, 55. Now, you could get away with just, again, keeping all these numbers separate and not having to add them if you don't want to. Part C, find the minimum number of bees. So you know it's coming. I mean, typically with these rate in rate out problems, there's always going to be, not always, but there's usually going to be a, 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 a section, a, a portion that's a part that's going to ask you about absolute max, absolute min. But it's so always important that we can build our equation out so that we can use this to help us find max and min. OK, so we need to find our candidates between zero and four. So find to find critical points, we need to uh, set our we need to find B prime, right? B prime, set B prime equal to zero to find our critical points. So B prime is we know that's the constant that goes zero. The derivative of this is going to be E of T. The derivative of this is L of T. So B prime is simply just E of T minus L of T. Now. B prime must be equal to zero, so we got to set B prime equal to zero. So we have to set this equation equal to zero, that our equation given to us is already at the rate level, at the E of T level. So E of T minus L of T, we got to do this by hand here, work this out. We can factor, um, take out a GCF of negative three, continue to factor, we get one and five. Now, these are critical points, but five we can remove because our bounds, our interval is only from zero to four. So we definitely have to test the number of bees at zero and four, but we only need to test what's between. So five is out, we're going to keep one. So we're going to do B of zero, B of one, B of four. Now, the nice thing is we already found B of four, which is 55. We're going to have to find B of one. Uh, to find B of one, we can put it back into this formula here. We do have to go through power rule again. Um, actually, we can just use the result from power rule and then just do from zero to one, all right? And that will give us uh, the number of bees one hour in. So between 35, 28, and 55, the lowest number is 28. So the minimum number of bees in the hive in that four hour period is 28. Now, this is, remember, keep reading your, uh, make sure you read your directions here. It, uh, the number doesn't represent the number of bees. It does, but it represents uh, uh, hundreds of bees. So. 3,500. So right now we've been using um, uh, these numbers, so we're not going to use as many zeros, but we have to know that these numbers represent hundreds, so 2,800 uh, bees. Okay, last one here, number eight. I want to make sure to include an area volume problem. So again, on the calculator, let R be the region in the first quadrant. We have Y equals square root of cosine of X. That's this curve you see here. I'm sorry, uh, this right here, um, this curve going down, root cosine X. You got g of x equals e to the x. That's um, this exponential function that's rising here. 
and the vertical line x equals pi over two. So that's this line here. Right, but do not evaluate the integral expression that gives the area of R. So R is just top minus bottom. So the top is the e to the x. The bottom is the um, the curve, root cosine x. So that's nice. You just have to write it, but not evaluate it. So you just have to set up that integral here. So from zero to power over two, top graph minus bottom graph, and that's it. So area. We don't put any square, we don't put pi. That's for volume, right? So area is just top minus bottom, dx. Find the volume of the solid generated when R is revolved about the x-axis. So here's region R. Okay, you're rotating around the line, um, the x-axis. So there's obviously a gap. The shaded region is not up. It's not a flat surface up against that dotted line here. So because of the gap, we have to build. We know this is wash method, not this method. So wash method from the dotted line extend to the furthest boundary. That's big R. Uh, from the dotted line extend to the closer boundary. That's little r. So top minus bottom for both. So top minus bottom e to the x is the top of my big R. Zero is the bottom of my little r, so e to the x minus zero, which is e to the x. Little r, top minus bottom, top is sitting at the root cosine x. The bottom is sitting at the zero, so root cosine x minus zero is root cosine x. So we got to set this up, and actually we have to solve it. This work, we can't uh, just um, set up and leave it alone. We have to actually go through it by hand and work it out. So uh, pi big r squared minus little r squared. This looks messy, but we can actually clean this up in the form that's actually easier to do without it, you know, uh, that makes it doable without a calculator. So this becomes e to the 2x, because x times 2 is 2x. And the nice thing about the root and the squared, they're going to cancel each other out. So this is going to be my revised starting point. And the nice thing is, like, I can go through a little bit of u substitution here, but this is doable. And cosine, it just becomes a positive sign. All right, so e to the 2x, we got to go through u substitution. u equals 2x, dx equals to u over 2. There's going to be a leftover of 1 half that's going to come out of this e to the u. So 1 half comes out in front. e to the u is just e to the u. That's nice. Replace uh, u with 2x. And then don't forget about the 1 half in front. So this is my antiderivative because cosine becomes a positive sign. The negative is going to tag along with my answer. Plug in my upper and lower bound. Pi over 2 in for x, so 1 half e to the 2 times pi over 2 minus um, sine of pi over 2 minus, we got also plug in 0. Now, this we got to be careful because the 0 is not going to wipe both terms out. The 0 will wipe out the sine, but the 0 is not going to wipe out this first expression because e to the 0 is not 0. Well, two, at 2 times 0 is 0, but e to the 0 is 1. So we got to keep track of that, that 1 that is still left over. So I'm sorry, yeah, the one is, is e to the zero is one, but there's a one half in front of it. So one half times one is one half. So we have one half e to the first, e to the pi minus sine of pi, which is minus one, minus one half, minus zero. So this cleans up to be just one half e to the pi minus three halves. Now, we don't want to forget that there's still this pi setting out in front. Right? All this is just the result of the integral, but don't forget about the pi that's going to have to tag along with your answers for disk and washer method. Okay, part C, last one here. Uh, region R is the base of a solid whose cross section perpendicular to the x axis are semicircles with diameters on the xy plane, right? But do not evaluate integral expression that gives the volume of the solid. Okay, so uh, first we got to make sure we know the direction of this uh, cross section here. It's perpendicular to the x axis, so that means we're doing a vertical base. 
So I redrew the shader region here. I did a vertical base. So top minus bottom is the length of my base, which is e to the x minus root cosine x. So from here, uh, this is one dimension. I got to get to the second dimension. Second dimension is the area formula. The area of a semicircle is pi over 8 base squared. So make sure you look over your um, area formulas for cross sections. I've got a list of five or six of them on the back of your summary sheet. Um, and, um, you know, pretty much all the formulas is base squared. You just have to um, adjust to the coefficient. Pi over 8 for a semicircle. Um, uh, root 3 over 4 for uh, equilateral triangle. 1 half for uh, right isosceles with leg on base. And then 1 fourth uh, as the coefficient in front for um, isosceles right triangle with hypotenuse on the base. So um, this will uh, change uh, my information from one to two dimensions. So this is just the height, but then I put this into the area formula. So now this gives me a second dimension here, um, my area dimension. So now I'm trying to get to the volume um, uh, dimension. So the volume, I just have to add a third dimension, which is the integral. Integral dx gives that third dimension. Um, so the integral of the area dx will be my volume. So I just put everything in place from zero to pi over two because my left bound is zero. My right bound is pi over two. And then my area component. No need to uh, work this out. They just ask you to set it up. OK, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I just um, uh, spent some time going over um, a, a new set of FRQs that uh, you haven't seen. Hopefully, if you had a chance to work through it beforehand uh, or uh, had a chance to kind of walk through it with me. Um, I just thought of one random thing uh, that I haven't had a chance to go through, haven't had a chance to review through, and that is um, depth and integrals um, involving absolute value. So I just want to give a quick review of this. So this, you're not going to do power rule. You're not going to do anything um, uh, in terms of the calculus steps. What you're going to do is you're going to draw the graph and just add up areas of triangles. OK, so you're going to draw the graph. And really, you're just adding the areas of two triangles. OK, so. First, understand that your absolute value of x uh, is a is having a V-shaped graph, but that x minus two is going to shift the graph to the right. So, if you set x minus two equal to zero, that's going to tell you where your vertex is. Your vertex is going to be at two. So you can sketch your graph. Okay. So at two, you can extend the graph. To, for, uh, to zero, it doesn't matter what the slope is. I mean, the slope is really one and negative one, but you can you just need to draw enough to help you um, gather information. So you're going to extend to zero and you're going to extend to five. Okay. And now you just have to figure out the heights of each of these triangles and the width of these triangles and add them together. And that's really because if I can draw the shape of this graph, I can just add these up because I'm just looking for the area between the graph and the x-axis. So um, I can plug zero into the function to get my order pair. So if I plug zero in for x, zero minus two is negative two, but with the absolute value around it, that gives me my order pair is zero, two. And that zero, two is gonna help me identify that the height of this triangle is two. Okay. And if I plug five, into um, the absolute value function, five minus two is three. Absolute value of three is still three, so my order pair is five, three. Now, let's see if we can figure out the dimensions of this triangle. My width is two. My height is two. Okay. For my second triangle here, my width is one, two, three, and my height is also three. 
So the area of my triangle is one half base times height. I'll do this twice, once for each triangle. So one half base times height. That's the dimensions of my first triangle. My second triangle is one half base times height. One half three times three. So this becomes four over two plus nine over two, which is 13 over two. So therefore, the integral from zero to five of the acid value of x minus two dx is 13 over two. So this is a fairly common problem that have shown up on um, non-calculator portions. So I want to make sure that um, <clears throat> that you know with this fairly easy problem that if it shows up that um, with this quick review that you would not struggle with this problem. All right, that's all I have, but um, if you, any of you guys want to stick around and ask any questions, I'd be happy to to answer any questions that you have. Um, you know, any random question or from any previous um, uh, packets. Otherwise, um, good luck tomorrow and hope you guys get some rest and hopefully um, you guys all do well on the, on the exam tomorrow. Yeah, sure. Uh, so justification statements. <clears throat> so EVT. No justification statements needed. Just show your work. So show how you found your endpoints, your critical points, and then how you tested them and how you arrived at your solution. So all the EBT problems, um, we just need to show the work. Um, uh, let's see, for mean value theorem, you can say uh, since f of x is continuous, on the interval, let's just say from one to five, and differentiable on the interval from one to five. Continuous is with brackets, differentiable is with parentheses. Then f prime of c must be equal to f of five minus f of one over five minus one, whatever that value is, somewhere on the interval from one to five. And okay, so whatever slope I get, <coughs> that rate of change is going to exist somewhere on the curve. Rule's theorem is very similar. Um, but with rolls, you're trying to guarantee a slope of zero. So what you need to also indicate, you can say that this is equal to zero for rolls, or you can say f of five equals f of one. Okay. You have to say, give some indication that, that you're trying to, that you that you've determined that there's a slope of zero between the endpoints, and then you're trying to find that slope zero. So Rolle's theorem, the same thing as mean value theorem, it's just this, this slope is always going to be zero that you're looking for. And I'm just choosing some arbitrary numbers here. Obviously, you have to um, pick the um, the interval that is applicable for your problem. Taking a different interval here. So you can write f of two equals f of six to indicate that it is producing a slope zero, or you can say f of six minus f of two minus six minus two equals zero. Then there must be a C. where f prime of c is equal to zero. I 
EBT mean value theorem rules. Uh, another one is IVT. So IVT has no calculus involved. It's just um, using logic to deduce that there must be a target point that lives, a, a Y value that lives on the graph. So um, let's say the problem says, um, um, is there a point where f of x is equal to 5? OK, so let's say the question is, can I, can I guarantee where that point is equal to 5? And let's say uh, the, the information on the uh, function, it, it tells you that you know, f of negative 1 is equal to um, 8 and f of 6 is equal to 4. Now, we and and somewhere they say that f of x is continuous. OK. So if you can draw this out to convince yourself as well, f of negative 1 is 8. OK f of 6 is 4, then there must be a point that where the graph is going to have to cross um, between 8 and 4. It's got to reach 5 somewhere between, right? If you start at y value of 8 and end up at y value 4, you got to you got to reach 5 somewhere in between. Maybe once, maybe twice, but at least once. So the justification that you can use for this, you can say since my function is continuous. And then specifically specify from negative one to six, because that's the interval that you, that, that uh, you can establish this. Then by IVT. There must. Oh, by IVT since. OK, so. This is there's more there's more than one way to do this, but this is the way that that you can uh, do this with the least number of least amount of writing. You can say um, <clears throat> f of six is equal to four, and four is less than five, and five is less than eight, which is coming from f of negative one. Then there must be. A point on the interval from negative one to six where f of c is equal to five. And this is a way just to establish to the to the grader that you that uh, students understand um that you know that the target point that you're reaching is going to be is you can make that conclusion uh, because you have a point below and a point above and you're specifying the interval where this is occurring uh does it matter if we use rolls theorem or mean value theorem for f prime of x equals zero it doesn't no it doesn't um so but if if um, but yeah, you could definitely use uh, uh, mean value theorem as justification for roles. Yeah, as long as you as I mean, because you know, they basically are coming from the same statement. So if you can show that the slope zero, um, whether it's slope zero or slope two, if you show the work, um, that's good enough. Yeah, so you can definitely use you can definitely use mean value theorem to name something that is for roles. But if uh, if a problem references roles, then you have to understand, OK, I'm that they are specifically asking you to to guarantee slope zero. So just understand that um, you can use mean, mean value theorem to, uh, for roles, but if they mention roles, you have to you have to know what they're talking about, that they're only specifying you to do slope zero.
All right, any questions? Any other questions? All right, good luck, everyone. Hope you guys spend just a, a last few minutes just to look over your notes, your summary, your review sheets, your formulas. All right, good luck, everyone. Looking forward to, to hearing um, um, your feedback on, on, on how things went. See you guys, have a good night.